All right, 1 Kings chapter 10. So tonight, I'm going to tell you a story. I like to tell stories, and this story is a little bit different than a lot of the stories you've probably heard me tell. You know, you're probably thinking about the story of, you remember all the kids are smiling, they're like, oh, we're going to talk about giant spiders again. Or, you know, the story that I told, you know, we were out hiking about the San Joaquin uh, Valley River cave monkeys. They're not real, Brother Angel. I just made it up. Okay? So, this story is different, though. This story is different. This story is in the Bible. It's a great story. The stories in the Bible are great. They're much better than any story we could ever come up with. And they also apply to our lives, which is the great thing about the stories of the Bible. So, tonight we're looking at 1 Kings chapter 10, and we're looking at the story of Solomon and all the people. So, Solomon already has all the wisdom that God gave him, and people are traveling all over the world to hear the, the wisdom of Solomon and to, you know, just ask him questions. You know, people, it just goes to show, people have always had questions in life, and they, they've just had questions about things, and it talks about, you know, how these people came, and, you know, they asked Solomon these questions, and then they gave him great treasures. You know, the main story we're looking at is the Queen of Sheba. She came, and she brought all these these treasures to King Solomon. Now look, I mean, a side note here is if you know you have answers to hard questions, you're probably going to do okay in life. All right. So you know, if you just if Solomon would have just gone to the Queen of Sheba, would have come to him, asked him questions, and he just didn't have any answers, she probably wasn't going to leave him much. All right. But he knew all the answers, and it was much more than she ever expected. Look down at verse number one. So I want to tell you this story. And then, you know, I'll take a few minutes, we'll look at the story, and then I'll explain how it applies to us here, how it applies to us in our lives, how it applies to Verity Baptist Church, Fresno, as we're at our, our one-year anniversary. And let's just look at that tonight. So look at verse number one of 1 Kings chapter 10. The Bible says, And when the Queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. She came to see if it was true. She came to come and bring these hard questions that nobody knew the answers to, to see if this rumor was true about his great wisdom. And she came to Jerusalem with very, a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold, and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her of all her questions. And there was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. So he answered everything. And when the queen of Sheba had seen all of Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built and the meat of his table and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel and his cupbearers and his ascent by which he had wept, went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. He answered everything. And not only did he answer all her questions, she looked at how you know, he, was, he was managing his kingdom. She looked at how he was... He was treated by his servants and how, you know, just how this man was prosecuting his life. And he answered every single question. He didn't give her political answers that were splitting hairs and not really answering. the. He wasn't dodging questions. He answered every single question correctly to the way that she wanted. And look at verse number 10 for sake of time. And then the Bible says, And she gave the king an hundred and twenty talents of gold, and of spices, very great store, and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. So the queen of Sheba is the main example of what was happening to Solomon, but this was happening to Solomon from all over the world. People were sending him treasures and asking him questions, and he was just, his wisdom was... Basically, just how he gained and acquired all his wealth that was also a blessing from the Lord. Look at verse number 16. This verse number 16 tells us what Solomon did with just some of the gold in verse number 16. The Bible says, And King Solomon made 200 targets of beaten gold. 600 shekels of gold went to one target. And he made 300 shields of beaten gold. Three pound of gold went to one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. So he makes these targets. The targets are a bigger shield. So, so he basically makes all these golden shields. So he makes it, it, the, the big ones were like, if you work out the, you know, the, the archaic weights and everything, they're about 15 pounds of gold. And the small ones were three pounds of gold. I mean, that's, that's a lot of gold. When you look at you know, gold today, you know, how much it's worth. But the, the guy just had all kinds of gold. So he makes these 
part of his riches, and then you can read about the things that he overlaid in gold and all these things. But it's interesting because he makes these shields with some of the gold that he gets from the queen of Sheba. So look, these shields can really represent God's wisdom, God's gift of wisdom onto King Solomon. Because that is what gained him all the treasures that he got. It's where his treasures came from. It's where King Solomon's treasure. I mean, how many, do you know how many books and how many movies and how many different like historical accounts have been written about King Solomon's treasure? I remember I read a book like 15, 20 years ago about this theory of, of where the treasure ended up. And I, don't, I guess there's a stupid show about it now, but it was like, oh, the Knights Templar found King Solomon's treasure, and they, they got kicked out of Europe, and they took it over to... And it was the greatest treasure that anyone could ever imagine on the earth. You know, they, they estimate... I can't even remember what they estimated it to be, but it's this huge mystery of where this treasure goes. Books and books and books, and studies and studies and studies have, have written about where this treasure went. Where did it go? But guess what? The Bible tells us where it went. The Bible tells us, like, in just a few chapters, where the treasure went. And, what, and not only where it went, but why it went there. I mean, aren't you, isn't this an exciting story? We know where King Solomon's treasure is. Amen. You don't have to go and watch all the dumb movies or watch the show on Oak Island or whatever. You know, we know where it went. And we know where they came from. And we know why they were taken away. Is really the point I want to make tonight. Fast forward to 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter 14. Let's look at the kingdom of Rehoboam, who is Solomon's son. Rehoboam. Now, of course, we all know the story. Rehoboam lost the kingdom. The kingdom split underneath Rehoboam. That's not what we're going to focus on, on this evening. So in chapter 12 of 1 Kings, you know, it's a judgment on Solomon, first of all. You know, Rehoboam's pride basically helped God's judgment come to light. So in first number, or, or chapter number 12, Rehoboam you know, has the kingdom split, where two or three tribes go with Rehoboam to the lower kingdom of Judah, and that's where we get the northern kingdom of Israel, is in 1 Kings chapter 12. But it's interesting to point out that Rehoboam, even after his mess up, where he, you know, God judged Solomon and he judged the kingdom under Solomon, you know, through his son Rehoboam, it's interesting that Rehoboam still had a kingdom to lead. Rehoboam still had the lower kingdom of Judah that he was in charge of. He was still the king over that lower kingdom. Now look at 1 Kings chapter 14. Let's look at how he did with that lower kingdom. He's already, the, it, the split has already happened. He's, he was told not to go to war. God said, look, this thing was of me. He's like, this was judgment on your father, judgment on Solomon, and, you know, I just used your stupidity, basically, to make the judgment come true. And in verse number 14, we see how Rehoboam prosecutes his leadership on the lower kingdom of Judah. Look at verse number 21. And the Bible says, And Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was 40 and one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem the city which the Lord did choose out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Nama of the Ammonites, and, Am Nama the and Ammonites. And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed above all that their fathers had done. Doesn't sound like they're doing so well in the lower kingdom here. Look at verse 23. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every hill and under every green tree. And it gets worse. Verse 24, And there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of, of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So imagine that, Sodomites doing abominations. I mean, imagine that, right? Look, Rehoboam lost the United Kingdom as it split. We know this. But, we know this was also due to his pride, and mainly God's judgment coming through um, on Solomon, on, his, on Solomon's past disobedience to him. But look, he still had a kingdom to rule, and he blew it there too. He blew it. He forgot the Lord. He allowed evil into his kingdom. He, you know, worshipped idols. He allowed the Sodomites in, you know, to do all these abominations. Look at verse 25. 
And it's interesting because now we hear about some of Solomon's treasure that he built up. And this is where Solomon's treasure went. Right here. I mean, it wasn't even that long after Solomon was gone that the treasure was lost. 1 Kings chapter 14, look at verse 25. And it came to pass in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, the king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. And he even took away all. Look, he took everything. And he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. And King Rehoboam made in their stead. So he lost everything. He lost all the treasure that his dad, that, that the blessings that God put on his dad were all lost now. All those physical, worldly blessings that came from Solomon's wisdom. They were all lost. And specifically, the Bible tells us that the shields of gold which Solomon had made, they were taken as well. The Bible points that out, that those shields were taken away. And then in verse 27, we see that Rehoboam does something here. And King Rehoboam made in their stead brazen shields and committed them under the hands of the chief of the guard, which kept the door of the king's house. And it was so when the king went into the house of the Lord that the guard bare them and brought them back into the guard chamber. So look, these shields that were once a symbol of God's blessing were now something that were just used as a show for Rehoboam. When he went to the house of the Lord, he had these shields brought out and, you know, it was used as a show. So when he went to the house of the Lord, these shields, people were walking with these shields with him. And then when he got to the house of the Lord, they put them away. But look, not only were they used as a show, they were fake. They weren't even real. They were brazen. They were made of brass. You know what brass looks like when it's all polished up? Kind of looks like gold. So he faked the shields. He lost everything, but then he made fakes to make it look like he was still, you know, he still had what he didn't have anymore. So you say, man, he's like, what does that have to do with us? Well, first of all, it's a good story. And you don't have to read any more stuff about, you know, the Knights Templar taking Solomon's, because it was already gone by the, the year 1500, you know, 15 century or whatever. It was already gone. I mean, it had already been taken away. So how does that apply to us? How does it apply to Verity Baptist Church in Fresno, California? So we've been here for one year. I don't know how that's happened, but we're, you know, look, we're here today to celebrate how awesome all this is. That we've been here for one year. We're here to have a great weekend. We're here to fellowship. Like, you know, like that's like the biggest side benefit of having a good church. It's just like all the fellowship that just comes on, this, on the fringes. Right? It's not the purpose, like Pastor said this morning. But it's, it's, a nice little, it's a nice little bonus. Amen. But look, I submit to you today, this evening, that we've been given some golden shields here. I submit to you that we've been given some golden shields in Fresno. We've inherited those shields in Fresno. As Rehoboam inherited the shields from Solomon. You say, what are those? You know, look, we, we've inherited a lot of blessings here. Maybe you think, maybe you think, let me, you know, let me say this. Maybe some of you come here from Sacramento and you're like, boy, things seem like, let me just talk about this for a second before I get into the, the shields that we've, that we've inherited. But look, you may come here from Sacramento and see, say, like, wait, this looks a lot like Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento. When he reads the announcements, it sound, the bulletin kind of looks the same. They kind of talk about the same types of things. Things seem to operate in the same way. Let me tell you something. There's nothing wrong with duplicating success. I mean, there's nothing wrong in the world. Like, don't be this type of person in your life where every idea needs to be your own. This is a side sermon here. I mean, if you are this type of person, you're going to miss a lot of good things in your life. Don't be this type of person that needs to reinvent every wheel because, you know, because you need to, to be your wheel. Verity Baptist Church, Fresno, we, we, we've inherited some success, and there's nothing wrong with duplicating success. Man. Nothing at all. I mean, Verity Baptist Church in Sacramento is coming up on its 10-year anniversary in a few weeks. I mean, I can't... I mean, it's an extremely successful ministry. Look, that is not an accident. 
That is not an accident. As we reflect on one year, I want to look at a few areas that our golden shields passed down to us. And you know, we need to duplicate success here when we see it. When we see success, we need to duplicate success. We could go off in our own area. We could go off, you know, be these people that, hey, I'm going to try it this way. But, you know, there's a lot of mistakes, a lot of pitfalls with that type of thinking. And, you know, I, I often said, you know, I, I think in my life and especially my secular career, maybe one out of ten ideas is a good one. And it's recognizing the nine that aren't good and getting rid of them as soon as possible that makes you successful. But look, if you're in a room and you, you see successful people and, you know, look, you can take their one idea too. And then there's more than just one out of ten. There's, you know, five out of fifty to choose from. There's nothing wrong with duplicating success. So what are these areas? What are these golden shields that I'm talking about? There's a lot of them. I just picked three for sake of time. But here's the first one. Here's the first one. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. Here's a golden shield that we've been given at Verity Baptist Fresno that we need to protect. Look, practical preaching is a golden shield. Practical preaching is a golden shield. Look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 24. Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 24. The Bible says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, look at the next words, Whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. I was talking to Brother Stuckey the other day, and, and we were talking about how thankful we are that we came out of this culture of practical preaching. That we came out of this culture that is preaching, look, that, that not only teaches you what the Bible says, but teaches you how to actually do it in your life. Because look, you could be a really smart fool when it comes to the Bible. And it, I mean, the Bible says, look, the Bible says it's the difference between, you know, your foundation being a rock and being the sand. Whether or not you do with it. Whether or not, it, it's not, you know, just knowing the Bible, it's doing what the Bible says. That's where the practical preaching comes in. Like, hey, we're going to teach you what the Bible says. Now we're going to teach you how to, tell you how to put it on your life. We're going to tell you how to, some things you need to change. Some things that you need to fix and why what you're doing in certain situations is not what the Bible says. And it's going to make your... I mean, do you ever wonder why so many people seem like... You ever, you ever met somebody that seems like the wind just blows a little bit and they're just completely knocked off their Christian life? Where just some small things happen or maybe even a, you know, a mediocre things happen. They're just knocked out of the Christian life or they're just, they're just backpedaling in the Christian life. It's because, it's because they're not practicing what the Bible says. That's what it is. So that's why we're thankful for the practical preaching. I mean, just this, it's, it's made me the kind of preacher that I am. To make the messages the way that I do. Brother Stuckey said the same thing. To just make these messages, and it's because of, it's because of the golden shield that we inherited from our teacher, who, is, who teaches practical preaching who tells you not only what the Bible says, is knowledgeable about the, what the Bible says, but shows you how to put that on your life. Look, it would be easy to replace this. I'm telling you. Trust me. It would be easy to replace this with a, with a brazen shield. Because as I'm writing sermons, and I'm thinking about the applications, and I'm thinking about the church, as I'm writing the sermons, and I'm like, whew. Many times I think people aren't going to like this if I say that. Many times I think, man, is that, is that, is that going to offend some folks if I apply this here? If I apply this here? Many times I think that, but I just write it down anyway. Because look, it would be, it would be easy for someone to not do it. 
You know, to never say anything could, that could slightly offend people. That, that would be an easy thing for people to do. To, to go against, in what you say, to go against, to literally, you know, apply things that are against the way you know people sitting in the pews are doing things. Now, I mean, that can be a little bit of an uncomfortable situation. It would be easy to replace that shield and turn it to brass. And look, a lot of people do that. A lot of people do that today. You know, I mean, it'd be easy to just preach a feel-good mes message every single Sunday. It would be really easy to just get up here and just tell you all how awesome you are and how, you know, you're awesome and just stay awesome. And I don't, I don't even know how to do it. I can't even do it right. Okay, but the point is, look, it's, it's easy for people to d fall into. It's easy, to, I mean, a salvation message every Sunday? You ever been to one of those churches? That's how that happens. Because it's just, a, it's just a good message all the time. Look, salva I mean, salvation message, there's nothing wrong with a salvation message. But if you're saved, you need a salvation message today? I mean, if you're a saved, you know, person that's ruining your family, do you need a salvation message? Look, it would be easy to do it. Sometimes, sometimes, look, sometimes growth hurts. Growing as a church, it might hurt a little bit to hear a message that, you know, says, you know, I, I, I need to change in this area. I need to fix the way my family operates. I need to, I, I mean, I need to flip some, I mean, you want to come to church and feel good and eat some cookies and go home and sleep. You don't want to be like, man, i got to flip my whole life around now. I mean, it's work. It hurts. When you go home and you tell your wife, like, we're doing it all wrong. We've got to fix things. We've got to change things. We can't go here. We can't do this. We can't see those people. We can't do this with the kids. We have to change everything. Look, that is not an easy thing for most people to do. Growth hurts. That's why people turn that shield to brass. And that's why you don't see that golden shield much anymore. As Pastor said this morning, you don't see that, you don't see that golden shield much anymore. What's another one? Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Here's another one. A biblically run church is a golden shield. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Look, a biblically run church is a golden shield that we've inherited and that you don't see much anymore. Many times it would be much more comfortable to just let things go. Especially at the time. It just like just go the way any, everybody and anybody wants to go. But it would be a disaster. It would be a complete disaster. And the Bible tells us this. 1 Corinthians 14.40 says, Let all things be done decently and in order. And then the Bible gives us all that order. We preach sermon series about this. The order, you know, 1 Corinthians 5.11, all the things that we're supposed to do. Look, what did Rehoboam do? He just let the wicked abominations in. And he just let them stay. And he just, I mean, he lost everything because of it. That's one of the things that he did. Look, we could let, we could let sin in here. I mean, people do it. I mean, did you know? I mean, you do know because you've, we've been here for a year, you do know that there's certain things that we just won't allow here. And look, that's not, that's not comfortable. I mean, Galatians 5.9, a little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. Look, that would mean that, you know, I mean, forget the sodomites, they're never coming in here. I mean, that's an easy one. But look, we could let, we could let sin in here. And then you know what would happen? people would fall into sin. It would spread. You say, oh, you're, you're, you're mean for saying that, you know, you, you can't allow certain sins in the church like drunkenness and fornication and all these things. Look, it's loving. It's loving. We let sin in and the leaven spreads. And the kids, they grow up and they think this place is a joke. And you're a joke. You get up there and you yell about sin and it's a joke. 
Everybody knows that all this sin is going on in this church. It'd be a joke. I mean, people would leave the church. People would. Because Bible-believing Christians who are actually reading their Bible, we actually encourage you to read your Bible and know what it says. So if some person gets up here and says something that's stupid and unbiblical and wrong, you know. People would leave the church. People could turn to Jeremiah 23. People could quit the Christian life. I mean, I've heard pastor and other people say that, you know, the average church life of, of a Christian today is like seven years, five years I've heard before. I mean, what is happening? What is happening here? If people get right and get in church and then, you know, they fall out, I mean, sin is happening. That's what's happening. Look at Jeremiah 23. So yeah, these things that might seem comfortable at first would turn into complete disasters and they would ruin people. Jeremiah 23, and look, there's danger for the leadership too. Jeremiah 23 says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. That's what a pastor or a leader of a ministry that just lets sin in and just doesn't run the church biblically and just lets whatever go, they're scattering the sheep. Amen. It says, Woe be unto them. When God says, Woe be unto you, that's not where you want to be. Well, look, I mean, at the time, at the time, I mean, Look, it would be just much easier just to let things go. Because it's not comfortable. It's not comfortable having those conversations. You know, church discipline, that's why most churches don't do it anymore. That's why, look, I've been in churches my whole life. I've never even heard of it before. This church. Verity Baptist Church. I've never even heard of it. But it's right there in the Bible. So look, we're going to keep that golden shield. And I'm not talking about just church discipline, but look, we're going to... We're going to protect this church. Amen. We're going to biblically run this church decently and in order. Amen. That's what we're shooting for here. And you all, you, know, you all are helping you know, for that goal. But I mean, look, the bottom line is we need to protect, protect this church. I mean, truth is truth. Amen. And people are coming after the truth today. They don't, want, they don't want to hear the truth. They don't want other people speaking the truth. It's getting, I mean, it's getting a little scary out there. So, we see that we need to keep these golden shields. We need to keep the biblically run church. We, I mean, we see the golden shield of practical preaching and what that can do to turn our lives around and help us out and, and keep us in this Christian life. But here's the real big one right here. The golden shield that we have been given that we can never let go, it will be fatal if we let it go. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Is this. It's the first works. Amen. It's the golden shield of the first works. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Look at verse number 20. Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 20. The Bible says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Look at Revelation chapter 2 and verse number 1. It's interesting that the candlestick there is not necessarily in the church. The candlestick is the church in Revelation chapter 1. Look at verse number 1 of, of Revelation chapter 2. The Bible says, you know, you know, God, you know, Jesus is rebuking you know, a church here. And the Bible says, Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things that he hath holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor, like we talked about this morning, and thy patience, and how thou can, canst not bear them which are evil. So they're doing some good things here. Okay? They're not letting evil in. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Look, they're kicking the false prophets out. They're kicking the evil out. I mean, they're, not, they're doing some good things. They're not doing everything wrong here. And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, turn, change, change the way you're going, and do the first works, or else, or what? Or what, God? 
or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Look, he's like, he's like, or you're not going to be a church anymore. How's that sound? I'm going to take a piece of furniture out of the corner. He's like, the candlestick is the church. He's like, you stopped him. He's you're doing good things. You're not letting evil in. You're kicking all these false prophets out. Rehoboam messed those up. Rehoboam messed all those up. But they forgot the first works. And God's like, hey, you better turn that around. Oh, or you're not going to be a church anymore. Period. We better pay attention to this one. Look, we've inherited a golden shield of emphasis and a culture that is focused on the first works here at Verity Baptist Fresno. Amen. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's, that's like the easiest verse in the whole Bible to understand. If we lose that, we don't just lose a candlestick, folks. We lose the very church. We lose the church. Look, I mean, you know what we could do, though? You know what we could do? We could replace the golden candlestick with a brass one. Well, you don't think people do that? No. It'd look good. It'd look really good. It'd look like gold to the world. To the world, it looked like gold. To those around us, it looked like gold. I mean, the brass would look from a distance, it looked like gold. But to God, it's brass. Sorry, you got to have a golden one. Sorry, not a church. Yeah. To God, if we lose that golden candlestick, we are dead. Ever been in a dead church? No. Yep. We've all, or a lot of us, have been in dead churches. You know, the church... The church dies, you know, I, I kind of like looking at trends of things. It seems like this is the trend. The church dies. Dead church. Candlestick gone. The church dies and then they have two choices. They either go like mega liber, liberal church or they just go slow, dying, dwindling, slow death church. But, I mean, that's why you see all these, these big mega liberal churches they're just like hey all right all right we're dead we're dead let's just change the message it's just going to be this super hyper you know everything's going to be great you guys are great you come to church more often give more money it always comes back to money with the mega liberal stuff that's right it always comes back to that give more money come here and like everything's going to be great for you you know we'll just give you we'll just give you some spiritual you know heroin for a couple days and we'll send you off and you can just become whatever you were before you walked in the door and we won't tell you anything that matters and you know maybe they even have the right gospel some of these dead churches I mean I've seen those too they have the right gospel but they're just dead they're not doing the first works turn to Proverbs chapter 3 so look we don't want we don't want that to happen here that's like the that's like the you're not gonna survive that one you're not going to live through that. Right? That's a, that's a fight that if you go into that fight, you're not going to get a broken arm. You're going to die. I mean, God, that's why God tells us this. That's why He gives us the examples of the, the churches in Revelation. Look, He's talking to us. He's saying, if you do this, you're dead. Don't do it, or you'll die. You won't be a church. Look at Proverbs 3 3, or look at your bulletin. So, how do we, how do we not get there? How do we not have that happen to us? Look at Proverbs 3.3. 3. The Bible says, Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck. Write them upon the table of thine heart. So the Bible says, I mean, look, we know what the truth is. We heard about the pillar of the truth this morning. But look, the Bible says, Let not mercy and truth. Look, if you start losing mercy in your life, you know who you're going to eventually end up losing mercy for? The lost. If you have this person that's just unmerciful, eventually... You know, oh, you say, I'm just unmerciful to this guy. But eventually that's going to spread in your life. And you know, you're in danger, ultimately, of losing mercy for the lost. And then that leads to this fatal condition for a church, if everybody gets that way, or enough people get that way. 
So yeah, I mean, we need to study and learn the Bible. But mercy is right there with truth, folks. It's, it's right there with it. If we lose the heart for the lost, I mean, what I'm trying to get at is like, if we lose the heart for lost people, I mean, do you have a heart for lost people? If you don't, I mean, if you don't have a heart for lost people and you're going soul winning and you're just going through the motions, well, something's wrong. Something's wrong. Red flag. Look, I'm happy that you're soul winning. We're all happy that you're soul winning. But if you're soul winning because I'm telling you to go soul winning, something's wrong. You need to have that mercy and that heart for the lost. Because if this whole church, Verity Baptist Fresno, goes down this road where we're soul winning because we're supposed to, and not because we have a heart and we have mercy towards the lost, we risk the very church. Everything. Turn to Romans 10. Even Paul. Even Paul. I mean, he's just ripping face against the Jews. I mean, he's telling them. I mean, he's just beating them down. Think of Romans 9, 10, and 11. He's like, you've been cut off. He's like, you know, the gent. I mean, and then, I mean, can you imagine? The Jews, they were these, these hypocrites. They were high and mighty. They were the, the religious people of the day. And he's like, man, he's like the Gentiles. They couldn't, they were disgusted with the Gentiles. He's like, the Gentiles have been grafted in. You've been cut off and they've been grafted in. I mean, he's just, he's just, I mean, as much as he was tearing into the Jews. Look at Romans 10.1. I mean, look, I mean, they, they killed Stephen because of what he was saying. I mean, he was just offending them like crazy, the Jews. They were, they were like trying to kill all these guys that were saying this stuff. They were so offended about it. But in the midst of all that, look at Romans 10.1. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved is that they would recognize what they had done and they would, they would recognize Jesus Christ as the Savior. I mean, the, his whole point in his heart, where was his heart? His heart towards them was that they might be saved. How? Same way you were saved. Believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. So look, if we lose, I mean, let's just work the equation backwards. Let's work the equation backwards. If you don't do the first works, you don't have the heart for the lost. And, and at some point you lost mercy. So if we can see that that's the trend, we can recognize it up front, folks. That's why mercy is in Proverbs 3.3. 3. That's how important it is. And if you lose that in your life, look, you risk, you risk your heart towards lost people. You risk your desire to fulfill the Great Commission. I mean, that, that's a scary place to be. And, is, and is that, I mean, that's a scary place as an individual, as a Christian. But if it gets to the church like that, that, look, that, we could still have the truth here, folks. But a brass candlestick is not going to cut it. It's not going to cut it with God at all. So that is the golden, I mean, that is, is the golden shield that if we give up, it will kill us. I, 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 I want to say it like 10 times so you understand. And, it, and if your heart isn't right, Verity Baptist Church Fresno, something's wrong. Something's wrong. You should want to go out with that golden shield. That's the, look, that's the golden shield that we've inherited. That is the culture of this church. It will always be the culture of this church is to do the first works and to go out there and carry the gospel to a lost Fresno. To a lost wherever else in these little towns around here. And to a lost and dying world. That is our job. So look, we need to cherish these golden shields that we've been given. But here's just one last thing that I want to point out about these golden shields. And I could go on and on about golden shields that we've inherited. I could go on and on. But here's the thing. Look, I had a, I had a wrestling match when I had a lot of wrestling matches, but I had a wrestling match that just sticks in my head from my high school days. I think I was a junior in high school. It was at the state tournament. Really important wrestling match. And I had this, the thing about wrestling tournaments is this. It's a good thing and a bad thing. You get to, you, you have the brackets. They put the brackets, like who you're gonna wrestle on the wall. And then as soon as round one goes, they change the brackets. And you get to stare at that bracket and find out 
who you're going to wrestle for like two hours before the match. And I remember I had this one particular match, and they always put the guy's name, and we, look, it's North Dakota. We know who everybody is. All right? And they always put the guy's name, and then they put his record underneath his name. So you get to see, I mean, you know who he is and how good he is, but they put that record there just to stick it in your face. Right? So, I mean, my bracket was up there for my next match that was coming up in a couple hours. And I still remember the number. The guy that I was wrestling, I won't say his name. I remember his name, too. That's how it was tattooed on my brain. He was 42-2 and two on the year. This was the last tournament of the year. That means he had 42 wins, and he only lost twice in the whole year. And I just kept looking at that, and I knew who this guy was. It's like 42-2. and 42-2. Uh, and two. Uh. You know, I mean, I wasn't terrible. I was like 36-6 and six or something. But 42-2 and two is better than 36-6. and six. And I stared at that bracket, and my dad like, always hated me looking at those brackets. And I went into that wrestling match, and I went into that wrestling match, and I lost by a few points. And I came off the mat, and the first thing that my dad said to me is, he said, and you think about this, new sensitive parents. This is what my dad said to me. First thing, he said, you beat yourself. Because he knew, he was watching the wrestling match, and he knew that I was trying not to lose. I wasn't going out there trying to win. I was trying to stop everything that was coming at me. But I wasn't trying to win. I was just trying not to lose. That never works in anything. Here's the thing, Verity Baptist Fresno. Rehoboam. Rehoboam. He started with those golden shields. He started with the golden shields. He didn't have to go out and be wise and gain the, that gold and have his craftsmen make the golden shields. He started with them. And he lost them. He started with the golden shields like we're starting with the golden shields. It is our job to use those golden shields. We need to keep that golden shield of mercy and not replace it with the brazen shield of hypocrisy. We need to keep that golden shield to protect this church and the way it runs and protect this from the evil out in the world and not replace it with the brazen shield of complacency. Imagine a church that preaches the Word of God but doesn't practice the Word of God. There's a lot of them. We're going to keep that golden shield of practical preaching. A church that knows what the Bible says, that preaches, read your Bible, know what the Bible says, and then do what the Bible says. And then watch it work in your life. And you will see it. You will see it make sense. We, I mean, a girl today said to us, we were giving her the gospel. And just like again and again, it was, it's, it's, it's wonderful when they, they just get it like this. She's just like, that just makes so much sense. That just makes so much sense. I mean, she must have said it 10 or 12 times. I'm like, do you understand? Yeah, that, that, just, that just makes so much sense. Because she's been confused her whole life by the Catholic Church or whoever. Catholic Church in this case. Because look, that's some confusing stuff. It just makes so much sense. It makes so much sense that it's a gift and that it's, that it's free and it's forever. And then if we apply the practical teaching of the Bible to our lives, I mean, we'll just see that it's not God just trying to like puppet master your life for, for fun. I mean, he's, he's trying to help us here. So Rehoboam lost not only, <laughs> he lost not only the kingdom, but he lost all the blessings that Solomon had bestowed on him through his wisdom and everything. The golden shields were a symbol of that. And look, folks, brazen shields won't cut it. They're not going to cut it in this game that we're playing. And he walked to the temple under guard. Uh, I love that part. You know, with the, notice how he didn't use silver. I mean, silver is, is, is worth more than brass. He, 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 he used brass because he wanted it to look like the old thing. That doesn't cut it. That means nothing. That means nothing in this game that we're playing. Looking the part means nothing. We have to be the part. We have to have the real thing. Look, you know, that, I mean, that's kind of a scary thing, like going into the ministry when you think about it.
When you think about it, you know, you're going to go into the ministry and you want to have a real church and, and you know, you can't fake it. You can't fake it. It's real or you're going to die. You know, have a nice, have a nice day. It, it, look, you can't turn the candlestick to brass. That's the ultimate lesson here. We have, it doesn't work with God. The church, when the candlestick is brass and it's been removed, there may be a building and there may be people coming to the building, but the church is gone at that point. We've all been there. I watched all your heads go like this when I said, you ever been in a dead church? Everybody's been there. Everybody's been there. Look, if, here's the thing. Verity Baptist Fresno, we're going to protect these golden shields here. Especially the golden candlestick. And we know how to protect it. Because look, here's the bottom line. If the Lord's not in it, I don't want any part of it. And you should, you should feel the same way. Thank you for, for a, a wonderful year. You all are great. We're, we're growing and, and thriving together. I, I, I shouldn't say I'm proud of, of, of all of you. And I'm not proud. But I, I just... It's the joy of my life to watch you all grow and grow together in this Christian life. So thank you. Let's, uh, let's have a nice evening. Thanks for being here, everybody. Let's uh, bow our heads and have a word of prayer.